gaming experience with a computer game. The computer allows users to focus more on the gaming and less on the logistics. The success of the Pool of Radiance leads to more D&D licensed games. Some of them take advantage of the power of the computer to provide unique methods of gameplay and perspective. I don't know what it was, but even then, it's like I, I immediately gravitated towards Hillsfire, a game that no one remembers, really. I mean, it's, it's the, the forgotten Golden Box game. But it had this one little mechanic. It had a, a lock-picking mechanic that wasn't driven by those stats, and that wasn't just a recreation of the paper role-playing experience. And even then, I guess, I mean, I just, I just wanted to, to exploit what this piece of hardware and this medium does that, that, that other media don't. I mean, that just seemed important to me. A computer game offers uh, different things to a gamer than a uh, paper and pencil. Uh, part of it is a sense of immediacy. Uh, something is happening right now, right there. In a paper and pencil game, usually the DM will say something and uh, you'll get to talk with your, your friends uh, in the party or you'll think about it or whatever and, and nothing's gonna happen right this second unless the DM is really driving the action. The computer doesn't wait for you. You know, if, if there's a monster running down the hallway, unless you hit the pause button or something, it's still running down, you have to do something. Using new technology, SSI decides to let the character play in a first person perspective. Every once in a while they do something innovative, like Eye of the Beholder, was uh, to me the first time I remember what you would now call a third person perspective, where instead of looking down at essentially representations of miniatures, you'd be looking at what you were fighting. And that was pretty cool. Uh, so they would try different things like the Eye of the Holder series. It, it was a lot of fun. SSI continues to release games using the Dungeons & Dragons license, but the market wanes. I think the real answer, it isn't, isn't much of a mystery. I mean, I think it's just that after a while, any license needs to be rested. I mean, you just people just get tired of the same stuff. And I think it's just people people were looking for novelty, they were looking for something new. I mean, it, 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 they couldn't find it in D&D licensed games anymore, at least for a while. And improvements in technology lead to gameplay so immersive that it draws people away from the role-playing games of the past. I think Doom really sent Dungeons & Dragons type games into decline. Doom style games are addictive. You know, you sit down and you play and you get drawn in and, and they're fast and they're scary and, and, and they're, they're, they get your adrenaline going in a way that most role-playing games don't. Doom really changed the market. I mean, it was, a, it was a turning point. And just as the Dungeons & Dragons computer games begin to lose their audience, TSR also begins a wobbly spiral that points to bankruptcy and a game that really does have an end. TSR found out it was in kind of financial trouble, and people were wondering what was going to happen next. Just as TSR, who 20 years earlier had first published Dungeons & Dragons, was going out of business, a company called Wizards of the Coast sweeps in and saves the day. Well, then along came Peter Atkinson and Wizards of the Coast. Peter and a man named Richard Garfield had created a card game called Magic the Gathering. It became enormously successful, and Wizards of the Coast purchased TSR. Not only does work begin on a new rule set for the paper game, but a computer game is created that will bring Dungeons & Dragons back to monitors everywhere. Well, Greg and I uh, have always been huge fans of role-playing games. There hadn't been a lot of role-playing games released for a number of years before BG came out in 98. And so that was pretty cool, because I was like, like, you know, games like Pool of Radiance were very inspiring to us, so the opportunity to work on a D&D &D game, Dungeons & Dragons, RPG, like the next generation of it was really exciting, so we just jumped on it. Baldur's Gate provided a unique game experience. It, it took the, the whole top-down perspective of the SSI Goldbox games to a new level. You had a much more fluid combat system, you had uh, more options uh, as to like spell casting and character class and everything, and of course you had much better graphics and sounds. If the old SSI games were lacking in anything that they could have possibly had, they didn't have a lot of story or background. Baldur's Gate games did. 
You know, you had to solve a puzzle, you had to learn about the world. And they really conveyed that. Baldur's Gate is a story as much as it is a game. The game successfully replicates the D&D rule set, allowing players to focus on the story and characters that make up the world they explore. It clicked on a lot of things and, and just did them right. You could have a, a whole party of characters. Uh, you could pause the action. You could individually command what each character was doing. So if you're a D&D fan, here was a, a great way to go in and play a game where you could basically test out some of your ideas about tactics and that sort of thing. And we were really careful to tr tr remain true to the license. One of the things we're very careful about when we work on licenses like Dungeons and Dragons or Star Wars is that we want to make sure that we, we retain the original vision. The fans are, they deserve to get what they're expecting. If they're, they're expecting a game that's true to that original rule set or that universe, they should, they should see it in the final title. The success of the game leads to several sequels, all of which become bestsellers. It was also based on the Dungeons and Dragons license, and I think that had a big part in, in getting the, the name recognition out for the, the title. It, it gave us a starting point that allowed us to kind of leap off and, and, and get more people knowing about it. And now, a new type of game lurks over the horizon, one that will bring the social element back. So, you know, the natural extension of, of being able to take d and is to a computer, you combine that with the internet, and all of a sudden you have the opportunity for the massively multiplayer RPGs like EverQuest and Final Fantasy, and, and that is, that just takes the coolness factor up a, a whole other level. Ultima Online and EverQuest paved the way for a steady stream of other massively multiplayer online role-playing games. They can, they can play with those games and they can interact with each other. Even if it isn't quite as quite the same as sitting across the table, you can still instant message your friend and you can talk out of character and you can go on an adventure together. It's great that, that there's that avenue. But some people still feel there are fundamental differences between these games and a true Dungeons and Dragons experience. Online games right now typically ask you to, to accept a world where everybody is a hero. And in a D&D campaign, it was you with five of your buddies going in and being heroes, and that's very different. It's when, when you're alone solving really big problems and, and acting heroically, that's very different than standing in line while the guy in front of you kills a dragon and gets the experience, and then you walk up and kill the dragon and get the experience, and then it you know, rematerializes and the guy behind you does it. I mean, when everybody's killing that dragon, nobody's a hero, and D&D is all about being heroes. Despite the popularity of the online games, other companies continue to pursue the single-player experience, including a game that promises to allow players to create adventures for their friends and recreate their favorite adventures from the past. The, the more recent Dungeons & Dragons games are, if anything, even more faithful recreations of the, the original game, and you got to respect uh, the, uh, the polish and professionalism with which they, they've been implemented. Uh, they're, they're telling some really cool stories. They're letting players uh, you know, pick their roles in very traditional ways. Uh, and I, I love the fact that they're character-driven, story-based experiences. As we look back over the past 30 years, it's hard to find a game that hasn't been influenced by Dungeons & Dragons. Dungeons & Dragons uh, has had an amazing impact on society that a lot of people, I don't think, are really aware of. And that effect is, is just being the, the, the game that laid out, this is what fantasy gaming is. The whole category of role-playing games, they're pen and paper based, all grows out of Dungeons and Dragons. And looking into the future, companies will continue to try and perfect the experience of playing Dungeons and Dragons without actually playing. The idea of Dungeons and Dragons, I think, is driving the simulations like they're not common. Ultimately, that may be what the legacy of Dungeons and Dragons is. like. This is what started it, and it's this idea that drives this stuff. The future for Dungeons & Dragons, I think, is, is very bright. For one thing, I think that uh, no matter how fancy the, computer get, the computers get, it's still fun to sit around a table with all your friends and play a game in kind of slow motion where you, everybody can see what everybody else has done. That experience is not going away. There's going to be the, the fusion of the best of both worlds, where you can get the, the fun of sitting around the table with your friends, but have the computer doing all the heavy, heavy lifting.